Uh, Michael Sinatra, uh, the director of the Centre de Recherche Interuniversitaire sur les Métiers Numériques. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone online and in the room uh, to the second annual Stéphane Sinclair Crin uh, lecture dedicated in honor of uh, uh, Stéphane Sinclair, who was one of the founding members of the center in 2013, along with my colleague Jason Camlot from Concordia and Marcello Vitali Rossati from University of Montreal. Um, so to begin this event, I'm going to invite Dean Lisa Shapiro from McGill to say a few words of welcome. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, today on the occasion of the second annual Stefan Sinclair CRIHN lecture, named in honor, as you know, of McGill Professor Stefan Sinclair, to celebrate the important contributions he made to the academic community, not only at McGill, but also in Montreal. Um, Stefan joined McGill in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures in 2011 as the co-creator of a widely used online tool, Voyant, uh, who I should say, um, my new assistant, uh, Sandra Lausanne, who was a master's student here in uh, German, has recollections of using Voyant uh, in her, her master's work. Um, uh, um, he arrived at McGill with the charge of advancing the field of digital humanities here. Um, he also arrived to a newly amalgamated department uh, that's not so newly amalgamated anymore, and he made a mark as a generous colleague and friend whose openness was greatly appreciated and admired by his colleagues, something we should all aspire to, um, virtuous character traits. Um, McGill continues to build the digital humanities from the foundation led by Stefan. Last, last summer, acting dean David Hunter pledged funding to support the Voyant consor Consortium, which further develops and maintains the Voyant toolset. And we're grateful for the leadership of his colleagues, as well as Cecily Rayner and Andrew Piper, and, uh, and the over 20 faculty affiliates of the Digital Humanities Program here at McGill. Building on the ad hoc two-year MA in Digital Humanities that's been active since 2016, McGill submitted a proposal of a one-year master's in digital humanities um, to the Quebec government, and I believe we're still waiting for uh, um, to hear back from them with their feedback. Uh, so I know everyone's um, patient with the provincial ministry to uh, to to resolve um, to to get back to us with feedback. Um, there's also a minor under development uh, in DH at the undergraduate level. And we're hoping uh, that this will bring together various uh, digital humanities initiatives that are both across the faculty, the university, and of course, others working in digital humanities across the city. Um, it's also worth highlighting the particular place uh, digital humanities has in bringing together researchers at the Université de Montréal, UCOM, Concordia, and McGill in our respective faculties of arts um, through the Centre de Recherche Interuniversitaire sur les Humanités Numériques uh, based at UDM. Uh, this research group brings together um, not just people, but actually the variety of digital humanities uh, research in Montreal from text mining and data analytics, for instance, using tools such as those of network analysis to allow news stories to emerge from archival materials to using digital tools to tell the stories themselves and amplify them, to the most basic of tools, something I've, I've done uh, at least, uh, to make openly accessible, once again, printed materials that have disappeared, and to imagine and realize the potential of digital tools to do so much more and to further support, um, to further and to support humanistic research. So I'm really um, happy to to be here to to uh, be involved in this, and I've already uh, given my apologies to to Claire that um, as much as I would love to be here for the whole uh, whole uh, afternoon, I am going to have to duck out to uh, to go to meetings, things deans do. So, um, but uh, I look forward to being here for the part I can. Thank you, thank you, Michel Perrault, and thanks again for the support of McGill. And now I invite my Montdoyen, uh, Frédéric Bouchard, la Faculté des Arts et des Sciences de l'Université de Montréal, à venir dire quelques mots. Merci, Michael. Uh, C'est un plaisir de vous voir aujourd'hui. Je reconnais uh, des, des collègues uh, uh, de la Faculté. Donc, C'est un, un plaisir de, de vous voir ici aujourd'hui. 
Uh, Dean, Dean and colleague Shapiro, uh, it's not often that you get two philosopher deans in the same room. Uh, there are strict rules about that, usually. <laughs> anyway, so please, uh, hopefully there won't be any, uh, you know, consequences <laughs> to, to this. Uh, but uh, no, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, Professor Battershale, uh, welcome to, uh, uh, for this event. Uh, cher, uh, cher collègue, uh, cher étudiant, chers amis, euh, bon après-midi. C'est un plaisir euh, d'être avec vous, euh, malgré nos horaires euh, de doyens très occupés. Un événement comme ceci, euh, est, la, la symbolique est importante. Uh, we often talk about how universities are about knowledge, and it's true. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it's knowledge with a purpose, right? It's always, a, it's always about human flourishing some way. Some, you know, sometimes it's more distant, uh, sometimes it's more indirect, sometimes it's very pragmatic and, you know, doesn't need that much knowledge, but it's more about access, right? Uh, but it's always about human flourishing. And uh, this is why, and I think I said so last year, uh, that uh, I'm, even though I, I did not know Stefan, I had met him, I met him once, uh, but uh, I didn't know him well. Uh, I'm very touched by the fact that you organize an event in his honor. And just, uh, and uh, uh, Dean Shapiro uh, expressed some of the legacy uh, of our colleague, but in general, you know, just the idea that we celebrate the contribution of a colleague uh, is, you know, at the core in some sense of human flourishing, right? Uh, if it's ultimately about uh, being better human beings and caring more about uh, each other, uh, having an intellectual event that he would have loved uh, and uh, sharing together, you know, how your own contributions to knowledge enrich our understanding of the human experience uh, is, is uh, particularly touching. Uh, most of the meetings we have uh, today are only vaguely and indirectly connected to human flourishing. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, sadly. <laughs> Uh, this is group therapy for us, so, so thank you. Uh, but so it's it's important. It, it is it is uh, a privilege for us to to uh, actually to know and support th these kind of activities, and we encourage you to uh, keep on doing this. Uh, of course, in uh, Stefan's honor, but also just in in each other's uh, honor as well, and 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 benefit from this, and also share widely and broadly which is something that, frankly, digital humanities has been especially good at. Uh, yes, because of, of technology, but more importantly, just because of, you know, uh, object of interest. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, you should not lose sight of. You know, yes, we want, uh, we do want more grants. We do want more, you know, uh, more PhDs and whatnot. But just having kind of this uh, new knowledge about human experience be widely decimated is is uh, uh, is something that uh, has a lot of value in itself. Um, so uh, digital humanities, uh, you know, is is growing in Montreal. Uh, is, is doing so at McGill. Is doing so at Université de Montréal. Uh, so just a, a few uh, landmarks. Um, so we already have uh, an existing option in digital humanities or a PhD program in literature. Uh, but we'll also be offering a new option soon, uh, thanks to uh, Michael, uh, Mikael, and his other colleagues. Merci. This is what deans do. We just uh, so uh, we will have a new option in digital humanities uh, in our applied human sciences. Uh, program, PhD program in the fall of 2023. Also, we've launched uh, a new minor in digital humanities, as well as a micro program, so people in other disciplines can benefit from the work you're doing uh, and that you will be doing in the next few years. Uh, Kin, of course, uh, contributes to the efforts, not just contributes, you know, is a key actor, uh, of course, in this uh, strategy for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at University of Montréal. Uh, we're talking about 30 regular members um, and uh, 11, 12 from our departments in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and uh, also, uh, you know, we're increasing kind of the interdisciplinary aspect of it with new colleagues from the Département de Demographie, 
uh, who are you know some of the key experts in data. So I'm sure that will be a great of great benefit uh, for for your community uh, and proving that you know digital humanities is uh, anything but virtual. I mean, there's a, a real actual community that is growing, and uh, we're very happy to see that uh, happening. And we're very happy that it gives us also the opportunity to collaborate with McGill, uh, Concordia, UCAM, and other universities across the world. And uh, of course, you know, we're working on various projects that hopefully will translate in substantial support from funding agencies. But you know, we'll we'll see where the dice falls. But it's it's important that we have these structuring activities, and uh, I think it helps us all build uh, this research capacity. Uh, finally, uh, this winter, uh, Le Crin uh, will be holding its conference uh, series uh, this year with the anthropology department. Uh, again, extending the interdisciplinary um, interest in this. And uh, there will also be uh, a symposium uh, during uh, Le Congrès de la CFAS, Le Congrès de la CFAS, uh, au début mai, qui se tiendra cette année, uh, Université de Montréal, Polytechnique, HSC Montréal. Donc, je vous invite très fortement à suivre uh, les, les détails par rapport uh, à l'horaire. So, uh, we wish you, uh, a, a, you know, us to please make the most of this time, uh, because uh, one day, for better and for worse, uh, you may become a deans, and uh, you will only get to enjoy other people enjoying the, the type of scholarship uh, you're, you're doing. So please make the most of it, and we're looking forward to, uh, to the knowledge that you'll generate from this and the contribution uh, to human flourishing that it will provide. Donc, uh, bonne conférence. Merci beaucoup. Yes. And so, um, you know, now it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our plenary speaker, uh, Claire Badafields, who is uh, an assistant professor cross-appointed in the Faculty of uh, Information in the Department of English at the University of Toronto. She's the author of a surprisingly large amount of books, uh, you know, for somebody who just started in 2020. Uh, and I'll mention Modernist Live, Biography and Autobiography in the Ogar Press, Bloomsbury 2018, and uh, Women and Literature Press Printing, 1920-2020, Gendered Impression from Cambridge University Press in 2022. But she's also the co-author of Scholarly Adventures in Digital Humanities from Paul Grave 2017 and Using Digital Humanities in the Classroom, Bloomsbury 2022. She is co-director of the Modernist Archive Publishing Project. And today, and I'm going to share the screen immediately so that Claire, as she makes her way to the front, um, will be talking to us about uh, um, the lighting the windows of the past, feminist historiography, data visualization, and digital archive present. Please welcome. Claire Badassil, our second annual Stéphane St. Clair Green Lecturer. Merci beaucoup de m'avoir invité aujourd'hui et de votre hospitalité ici à Montréal. Merci surtout à Michael pour l'organisation de l'événement aujourd'hui. C'est un honneur et un plaisir d'être ici et je remercie également ceux qui nous rejoignent à distance. Um, thank you everyone so much for having me today and for your hospitality here in Montreal. Particular thanks to Michael for organizing the event today. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here, and I also thank and welcome those joining virtually. Uh, McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. I'm grateful to be a guest on these lands. Um, and I couldn't have hoped for a better introduction from the deans, because one of the things I'd like to talk about today is some of the, to step back a little bit from some of the sort of specific tools and tricks that we use, although I'm happy to talk about those in the Q&A, and think a little bit more about purpose and genre. So my talk today is entitled, Lighting the Windows of the Past, Feminist Historiography, Data Visualization, and Digital Archival Practice. The image I borrowed from Virginia Woolf for the talk's title, Lighting the Windows of the Past, is one I hope will offer a kind of methodological metaphor through which to see and apprehend both the gathering of ideas I'd like to offer today and the genre of the digital archive itself. I'm therefore going to myself light on several ideas and elements of digital archival project work briefly, each I hope a window into an aspect of digital archival practice or a way of seeing digital archives through feminist DH epistemologies. I'm gonna draw my remarks today primarily from my experience working on two very different digital archival projects the Modernist Archives Publishing Project, which I'll call MAP, 
for short throughout, um, a critical digital archive of early 20th century publishers' records, and Make Believe, the Prudhomme Library Project, a collaborative creative work that critically analyzes and uses digital archival conventions through fiction, multimedia and art installation, and community engagement. For humanities researchers, particularly those working in historical fields, archives and special collections often offer moments of illumination, scraps of information and data, and material experiences that we piece together in various ways in order to create scholarly narratives and analyses. Book historians and literary scholars like me often use those pieces of evidence to reconstruct the stories of books and the myriad social worlds that survive in them. The conventional way in which researchers access materials from special and rare books collections is to call up a specific book or piece of material that interests them and look at it carefully and often in fairly restricted circumstances, one book or archival folder at a time. Several scholars have written of the strange romance of this process, its material appeal, and its particularly rich potential for peering into the past. And yet, digital archives do offer a new kind of view and a different kind of pace for strolling past these lit windows, and the aesthetic and epistemological implications of them are as varied and complicated as the resources themselves. In what follows, I offer some thoughts and speculations about how we can see digital archives, how we can see our experiences as partial views from the outside, and what our seeing can tell us about it, as digital humanists about how to build the archives. Oops. <laughs> Doesn't want me to move ahead. Let's see. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, window one, collaborative her hermeneutics. To begin, let's all agree that no one, no one thought belongs to any one person. And yet, through the continued fictions of autonomy and self-aggrandizement required of the academy, we often stand up alone, seeming to tell the stories of our own thinking. But if encounters seed thought, and thought is communal and collaborative, one voice always emerges from many, and more so when we talk about digital projects, about digital archives. Whenever we speak of these projects, we're always talking about the work of so many people, past and present. One of the people whose work I'll be thinking through and with today, of course, is Stefan Sinclair. Hermeneutica, which he wrote with Jeffrey Rockwell, and which I'm sure many of you listening know well, begins with a meditation on exactly this idea, that dismantling the myth of the scholar uh, as individual, the scholar as solitary thinker, is one of the central projects of digital humanities work. Rockwell and Sinclair begin by analyzing Descartes' assertion that Quote, things made up of different elements and produced by the hands of several master craftsmen are often less perfect than those on which only one person has worked. They note that Descartes' assertion marks an important and in one way democratic notion of humanistic thinking. All you really need is an introspective moment alone in your kitchen in order to do some philosophizing. But they note practices are changing. We have come to recognize how intellectual work is participatory, even when it includes some moments of solitary meditation. And so as a kind of counter data to Descartes' claim, um, I'm providing here some images of some of my favorite collaboratively produced pieces of work of art. So this is the Ballet Russe, um, Messines choreography, costumes by Matisse. Um, this is Charleston Farmhouse in Sussex, a Bloomsbury co-creation of kind of artistic work, literature, and domestic interior decorating. Um, I would say also all books are collaborative productions. So this is an example of Virginia Woolf's rebinding of Flaubert's correspondence. And all conference panels are also collaborative works. So this is an image from a panel that I did recently at the MSA, which was really particularly generative. Sinclair and Rockwell reflect on the new kinds of work required by digital large-scale projects that simply can't be accomplished alone. We find ourselves working in teams, reflecting on how best to organize them, and then reflecting on what it means to think through with others. And so this is a picture of the map team. This talk wasn't exactly supposed to be about collaboration, but so many of the ideas that follow have their origins in shared labor that it seemed like a fitting place to start. I particularly want to recognize Alice Stavely, Nicola Wilson, Helen Southworth, Helena Clarkson, Erica Kavanaugh, Matt Hanna, and Elizabeth Wilson-Gordon from the MAP Project, and Heather Jessup from the Make Believe Project, who all share in the conception, execution, and developments of the two projects I'll be talking about today. I also want to gesture at informal conversations I've been having on ideas related to this talk, particularly with Sherita Warner and Amy Elkins. After all, Sinclair and Rockwell pretty much tell us we must consider shared work, 
quote, collaboration is a normal practice of humanities computing and should therefore be imagined as a part of any discussion of method. Digital archives are always a collaborative entity, from, from the hands of the digitizers to the acquiring librarians or archivists, to the producers of cultural products being digitized, to the scholars, students, and generally interested users who come together in these digital spaces. A radical acceptance that we must relinquish our individuality in these inherently and necessarily collaborative products seems crucial. This practice of acknowledgement itself, of course, owes a debt to deliberately generous feminist citational ethos advocated for by Sarah Ahmed and to the vibrant contemporary world of feminist and queer thinking in literary, cultural, and information studies in which situatedness and entanglement are central. And yet it still feels worth reiterating this point again, since post-Cartesian academic worldviews in the humanities still frequently prize the individual. Intellectual property still applies a colonial worldview to individual thinking, and these are still the norms within we and the digital archives we produce mostly operate. Digital humanities and cognate disciplines like critical information studies, media studies, and sometimes book history feel like spaces in which collaboration is normalized as practice and in which product made by several professional craftspeople may indeed be less perfect, but will also frequently be more interesting and perhaps more ambitious. It feels important, though, to continue to reaffirm and reassert these values. The notion of a perfect digital archive made by one person is basically kind of funny, particularly if you've ever tried to build one. They don't exist. In this kind of work, there is perfect and there is no alone. It's perhaps an obvious statement to say that digital archives, both mass and critical, have proliferated with astonishing rapidity in the past decade and have correspondingly evoked debates in digital humanities, both about digitization methods and about the affordances and limits of archival imaginaries and structures. And so here's our friend, one of the um, main resources. So how do we write history by making digital archives or contributing to them? How do digital archives themselves narrativize and visualize the past? What are the assumptions of the digital archive as a genre? While significant energy and funding has gone into making these archives from all sorts of quarters, an energy quickly accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic and its associated sudden requirement for new digital resources for teaching, learning, and mediating cultural experiences, the theorization of these archives in humanistic terms is still an area of development in the scholarly literature. In short, there's more to do as we enter into a different stage of maturity for some of these projects, a decade or even two into their development, in thinking about how we can and should see and read them as artifacts themselves. So, window two, windows and constellations, or how should one read a digital archive? As I consider feminist discussions of method and DH in book history, I've been thinking a lot lately about what I want to call method or me metaphorical methodologies, which is to say ways of working and thinking in the humanities that resist overdetermined arguments and move instead through figures and images, both visual and literary. I'd like to return to and dwell, therefore, on the image of the lit windows a minute to explain how I think it can be illuminating, both as a figure and as a feminist practice. If you've ever walked through a residential neighborhood at night, you've doubtless looked in through lit windows at the small human tableaus occurring inside. Seldom do you have any context for these encounters, for the silhouettes of people lifting cakes out of ovens, conversing animatedly with each other, or simply looking out. On rare occasions, you'll get caught looking up. Someone will notice you staring at them and look back at you and you'll lock into an awkward eye contact. On still other occasions, only the light itself will be visible a glow of lamplight, a bright fluorescent, a candle. To make sense of and give shape to these visions, you might look at the house itself, the window dressings, the architecture, the general vibe, but you don't need me to describe this general experience and sensation maybe when Wolf does it better. Quote, the windows of the houses are open, the blinds are drawn up. One can see the whole household without their knowing that they're being seen. One can see them sitting around the dinner table, talking, reading, playing games. Sometimes they seem to be quarreling, but what about? Or they're laughing, but what is the joke? Down in the basement, the cook is reading a newspaper out loud while the housemaid is making a piece of toast. In comes the kitchen maid and they all start talking at the same moment. But what are they saying? Upstairs, a girl is dressing to go to a party, but where is she going? There's an old lady sitting at her bedroom window with some kind of wool work in her hand and a fine green parrot in a cage beside her. Really? And what is she thinking? <laughs> All this life has somehow come together. There's a reason for it, a coherency in it, could one but seize it. 
The biographer answers the innumerable questions which we ask as we stand outside on the pavement looking in the open window. Indeed, there is nothing more interesting than to pick one's way about among these vast depositories of facts, to make up the lives of men and women, to create their complex minds and households from the extraordinary abundance and litter and confusion of matter which lies strewn about. A thimble, a skull, a pair of scissors, a sheaf of sonnets are given to us, and we have to create, to combine, to put these incongruous things together. While Wolf here is writing and thinking about the task of the biographer, compiling life stories from bits and pieces of evidence, it seems to me an equally fitting evocation of the sensation of opening archival boxes and trying to piece together the literary and his cultural histories we try to tell. The box opens like a window and you definitely don't get everything you need, all the details, all the complexities, but you do see something real. And from that glimpse, you try to make sense of the past and connect to it. When you're searching for method, you're trying to find the right kind of light to make the image just a little bit clearer. Digital humanities tools offer us different kinds of light. The work of quote, building up a life for, for oneself from skulls, thimbles, scissors, and sonnets stimulates our interest in creation, Wolf writes, and creating new ways of piecing together archival materials and transforming them into histories is always imaginative work. Digital archives take the experience of box as window and gives us, give us new kinds of digital windows to peer through. The figure of the lights in the windows works in part as a feminist metaphor because it emphasizes in the foreground what can't be seen or known as much as what can be. Special collections and archives are inevitably replete with gaps and absences. They can, of course, be many, there can, of course, be many uncontrollable reasons for this. Fires, wars, and bombings have destroyed historical records. Documents and books have been plundered, thrown in the sea, or simply lost. Absences can arise, too, from less material circumstances. Collections mandates that draw borders around particular disciplines, geographical regions, or time periods, and leave spaces in the interstices. Into these gaps, we can also potentially open points of access, as my last example will show, allowing public creative engagement with imaginative historiographies, inspired by what Sadia Hartman has called, in relation to the narration of Black lives, acts of critical fabulation. Rethinking visualization methods in order to place a feminist emphasis on gaps, silences, and erasures requires a rethinking, too, of the aims of these collections and archives in the first place, less to accumulate extensive material traces of the past, and more to always an always, par an al an always partial glimpse of the past that openly acknowledges its own partiality. An approach to digital archives that considers their narrative and poetic characters, as well as their visualities, will, will allow us to use the tools of poetry and fig figurative language and thinking to do what they do best, to make space for contemplation and lyric experience as a partial knowledge. Of course, the digital archive presents us with a further set of practical gaps and absences in the transition between the paper record and the digitized document. And there are many examples that one could pull about this, but this is just, um, a tweet from the Cambridgeshire Archives explaining what it would take to actually digitize um, their collections in full. And this is the, the question that is the bane of any archivist's existence is the why don't you just digitize everything? Um, this Wolfian idea of lights in the window follow on from another metaphor I've used recently to try and piece together the story of women working as letterpress printers through the 20th century. Part of what I hope to do with that work was intervene methodologically in the field of book and print history by considering how and why we might approach the study of women printers in a constellated rather than a comprehensive fashion. I focused that study on some very bright stars and some less visible ones, and some patterns and implications arose from seeing them all together, but I made no attempt to suggest that I was showing the whole firmament. The figure of the constellation has helped me to think about the extremely, cha extremely challenging process of example selection in a time period, the 20th century and into the 21st, that is so full, so diverse, and so complex that drawing out particular examples almost inevitably feels overdetermined by existing canons of print culture or feminist history or else completely random. Thinking about feminist historiography as a constellated practice allows patterns and suggestions of meaning to come into and fall out of view. It suggests that some kind of narrative is possible, but comprehensiveness is not the goal. I also hoped to offer with this way of thinking, a method in which other views of the field are not only possible, but explicitly welcomed. Part of this work also crucially involves looking outside of conventional institutional archives and finding materials and evidence in the kinds of informal digital archives nearly all of us now keep, 
for research on recent letterpress practitioners, for example, web communities, the Instagram archive, and the TikTok archive are particularly vital. If digital archives can light the windows of the past then, or, provided us with or provide us with the telescopes we need to see different kinds of stars, they can also offer us fleeting glimpses that are open to change and revision, that invite, for example, critical redescriptions of archival materials or new materials to be added. Um, I'm showing throughout this talk in the section headings a visual gallery of images of windows in the dark drawn from public domain image repositories and my own personal digital photographic archive, a way I hope of subtly thinking through the historical visualities and of playing with the relation between literal and metaphorical meanings. Okay, so now I promise we get a little more digital. Um, window three, interfaces. The interface is how most folks first see a digital archive. And here is where interaction troubles my metaphor a little, since interfaces invite the user to open the window, perhaps, to navigate around the historical scene. Hand lists and finding aids are often replaced with dynamic search and with the conventions, too, of user expectations and values and what they expect websites to look like. The question of interfaces can be a vexed one for digital projects. Research-based projects are often discouraged from focusing too much on interface design, especially because digitization, robust metadata schema and creation, and careful archival description tend to be investments that can last for decades, whereas interfaces change rapidly with shifting tastes, softwares, and design trends. Data is usually exportable or transferable to a variety of formats, hopefully, um, whereas a way, the way a site looks is often locked into its instance of a content management system. Custom design can be very expensive, and it's difficult to justify a high cost for a component of a project that might not last long. However, as Mitchell White Law writes, interface plays an inescapable role in mediating digital heritage. More and more cultural institutions are playing around with radical interfaces that present visitors with beautiful and inviting websites through which to access cultural materials. White Law calls for a move away from over-reliance on search and towards what he calls generous interfaces that innovatively invite exploration, honor the materials, and give web visitors something of a cultural experience akin to walking through the lobby of the Met or the atrium of the British Museum. And this is where I'm going to talk a little bit about the Modernist Archives Publishing Project, or MAP. When we designed the interface for MAP, we tried to strike a bit of a balance. We did the best we could as non-experts to create a functional interface for free by acting as DIY designers with the views, perfectly named for my purpose today, offered in Drupal 7. We integrated some elements of the interface that are important to us, such as the random gallery views of our different types of content, which captured some of the serendipity of opening an archival box without knowing what you'll find. These are the gestures that White Law encourages when he writes about generosity and interface design. They offer the reader a sense of some materials they might not ask about and might not stumble upon otherwise. We also still love our book-shaped logo and color scheme created by a former undergrad RA of ours from the University of Reading, Matthew Standage. We reached a turning point with MAP though when Drupal 7 stopped being supported and maintained and we migrated to a new CMS called Backdrop. This migration seemed to us the perfect time to rethink the aesthetic and functionality of our interface and to improve on some of the clunky features of the out-of-the-box views we'd been relying on to that point. We had also reached the point where we had a ton of material that feels a little buried within the site, and this is a common issue with interfaces that have a lot of material, with scholarly interfaces particularly. These are truly accessible only really if you know that they're there. We wanted something better. We also wanted to honor the roots of MAP in the design-focused and aesthetically beautiful books we digitize by creating a new interface that calls, the co calls on the combination of beauty and function found in the work of designers like McKnight Coffer, Vanessa Bell, and Enid Marks. Um, our team worked with two UX design students at the iSchool at the University of Toronto, Grima Batra and Shrishti Shashigari, to resign the site, redesign the site. The question of a feminist interface is a fascinating one we're still trying to work out, and we had a lot of fun talking and thinking with the students about that question. We're considering ways of subtly incorporating some of the historical visualities of the materials with some hand-drawn icons, for example, but for now, improved navigation, access accessibility options we didn't have previously, and a more navigable website, particularly for students, seems like a start. And I'll show you a couple more examples of the new interface. Um, this is a view of some of our ephemeral objects, and then this is how, what it looks like when you click through to an object to see the metadata, and each of the um, bits that appears in orange is a link to another section, so you can navigate that way. Um, oops. Yeah. 
If the interface is a window, it opens onto the high resolution images of archival documents that maintain something of their historical aesthetic and their physical material character. So this is the fourth window I'll call a digital documentary aesthetic. Art historians Katrin Glinka, Christopher Peach, and Marion Dork point out that the distancing effect of data visualization from the actual visualities of the cultural objects can sometimes create a necessary distance from history. Quote, the asset of computational analysis and visualization is often reduced to their benefit in regards to quantitative analysis, which implies a distancing from the singular object or phenomenon. At the same time, the object-centered nature of museums, art history, archaeology, and archives is fueling a, fueling a growing interest in harmonizing digital approaches with quantitative and interpretive methods, i.e. close viewing or close reading, an approach that they am aimed to extend with their work. This idea of distant viewing and close viewing is one we've been thinking a lot about at MAP in relation to the zooming in on digitized records, sometimes literally to be able to read pencil markings illegible on paper, and zooming out to analyze the metadata and take a longer view. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of the images of the kind of documentary aesthetic that arises when you look at the documents themselves and the photographs. And um, it's interesting in the in light of the user interface question to note that the most common interaction we get with the site is people downloading the pictures, right? So um, that's that's I guess how it's used most. Um, it's important, I think, to center the kinds of historical visual aesthetics that are telegraphed in the digital objects themselves as we think about visualization and to consider, as the digital art historians have done, the importance of preserving some aspect of those visualities in the way that we show collections. And it might not be quite as intuitive for thinking about these kinds of documents as it is for art history, where the visuality is the primary analytic component, but there's still a real aesthetics of this work that I think seems to appeal to students as well. Um, this is just even even the carbon copy typescripts are a particular kind of material artifact that have their own aesthetic. Okay, window five, feminist data visualization. So how then do we think of digital visualization as at once a way of seeing actual data and as an aesthetic practice engaged with the materialities and ephemeralities of the archive? A small digression might be illustrative. In 2016, Georgia Lupi, an information designer, and Stephanie Posavic, a graphic designer and artist, began to exchange postcards. Rather than serving their conventional function as souvenirs or travels of travels or fleeting tokens of love or friendship, these postcards represented a durational artistic experiment in contemporary information practice. The task they set themselves was as follows. Quote, each week for a year, we collected and measured a particular type of data about our lives and used this data to make a drawing on a postcard sheet of paper. We then dropped the postcard in the mail and sent it to each other. This pro project would become known as Dear Data, and the result was a friendship formed from diagrams, charts, and drawings. Lupi and Posavic published a book from the project and also offered an invitation. They shared their prompts that they gave each other with educator, student, and the public in order to invite hand-drawn visual representations of personal data and the exchange of data as a new and artful mode of community and relationship building. These are hand-drawn visualizations using a pa historical paper technology, but they're also intimate, full of intimate domestic data exchanged between two women finding their way in the world. I love this project, just to be clear, and it got me thinking a little bit about what the hand-drawn visualization might do for us as we think about visualizing particularly historical materials. Wolf herself sometimes tried out hand-drawn visualizations, as in this example from To the Lighthouse, where she draws the shape and structure of the novel, which she describes as two blocks joined by a corridor. Alternative forms of visualization, including not only the hand-drawn, but also the handmade, evoke a way of seeing visualization beyond the map, chat, chart, or graph, which brings me to cookies. One of those sub-projects we have for MAP is a volunteer transcription project. So we have volunteers who come to the Museum of English Rural Life, and led by our archivist, Helena Clarkson, they transcribe the letters that we've digitized for the archive. So at the moment, there are thousands of documents in the MAP archive. We don't have full text for everything, particularly for the handwritten materials. So the volunteers are doing transcription and encoding work for us. Um, and they reached an important milestone recently of having transcribed 100 letters for the site. So to celebrate that milestone, Helena baked 100 letter-shaped cookies and served them at a garden party for the volunteers. Um, 
I don't think she was deliberately thinking of this of, as the, of this as data visualization, but <laughs> but I couldn't help but see it that way. A representation of the labor that has gone into this transcription project and also a materialization of the letters themselves. And beside the image of the cookies is an image of one of all our volunteers showing his workspace with the transcription software set up. So this is one way I think of thinking about feminist data visualizations. I wasn't going to say feminist data visualization equals cookies, but that sort of is the summary of this section. Um, but I do want to think through and with the principles set out by Diagnazico and Klein in, in um, earlier than data feminisms, but then kind of reiterated in data feminism. These six core principles seem really important when we think about as a specifically feminist project, how we're going to visualize materials. So rethinking binaries, how we how we communicate in visualization, the limits of categories. This is a very challenging question when metadata often kind of enforces categories. Embracing pluralism, also difficult with visual representations of data, which seem to suggest a kind of defined uh, perspective. Examine power and aspire to empowerment. Consider context. Legitimize embodiment and affect. Again, the cookies. Um, and make labor visible. So data visualization, of course, is not simply another technology to integrate. It's a visual argument and persuasion, most closely associated with rhetoric and writing than software and code. And so one of the things that I hope to do throughout this talk is to think about how we can materialize and metaphorize the idea of visualization so that arguments about its constructedness are supplemented with different ways of seeing it. So we, I think part of this is where things get a little more speculative from my perspective. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about what we have done for visualization so far at MAP, and I hope that in the Q&A we can maybe talk about what we could do to kind of um, embody these principles a little bit more fully. So um, the very first visual, like proto visualizations that came out of MAP were some charts that I made out of the genre ledger books. So the Hogarth Press kept categorized lists of the genres that they published, so poetry, fiction, all that kind of thing. So I made some charts of those. Um, Matthew Hanna made some correspondence networks, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. We also have done some visualization of historical quantitative data, which requires a really specific approach, right? These are the ledger of financial, financial books from the 20s and 30s. So we're not creating new data or changing the data. We're transcribing historical data and then analyzing it for what it is. And that's an area where attention to gaps and absences is really, really important because you can't expect good math from, from some of these documents. Um, and then we've also kind of worked with a with Josh Cotton and Rebecca um, Kieser at um, the Shakespeare and Co project to combine the the data from the from Sylvia Beach's Lendering Library cards with the data from MAP. So doing some kind of cross project work. Um, so yeah, so the challenge about working with this is that anytime you make a map or a graph, it just looks really official, right? So um, this is one of the ones that Matt made of the network. So this is all of our people within the map kind of um, data set. So these are all of the people who have any kind of document or book or record within the system. And Matt designed this to kind of give a little nod to a famous diagram pre-DH um, called the Tangled Web of Modernists. Um, and of course, you can see that there are there are limitations to this, the boundedness of the circle, but it also shows these many, many interconnections across the circle. And these, um, I can't do interactive very well in PowerPoint, but this is an interactive visualization. Um, similarly, on a much smaller scale, you can, one of the things that has been useful for us, I think, is to visualize correspondence networks relating to a specific book. So in order to kind of tell the story of how a book was produced, you can see all of the connections through letters that were required in order to make it. So this is an example from E.M. Forster's correspondence networks. Um, you can also do reader and borrower networks. So this is from the Shakespeare and Co. Um, data set from their lending library cards relating to Wolf. And the blue dots are like the Wolf text. And then the yellow dots all around are the different readers and borrowers who borrowed the book. And so sometimes you can see that some of the borrowers borrowed the same the same several titles, some borrowed only one. There are different ways of kind of like analyzing and interpreting these patterns, none of which are totally self-evident, right? Because there's a lot of kind of um, uncertainty about borrowers and readers. So this is where I'm hoping we can talk about this afterwards. What I would like to figure out now is what we do with this material, with the other data that we have and how we think about visualizing this work in a kind of potentially more nuanced and more artful way. So what we have to visualize includes the person materials like you saw in the diagram. We have the correspondence data. 
We have book data, so that's metadata about all of the kind of publications relating to a number of different modernist texts. We also have geospatial data, both on the presses and books, and also I don't mention it here, but on the distributed archival materials. So one of the reasons for the creation of MAP was that the archive of the Hogarth Press, as with many publishers' archives, is distributed now among many, many historical collections, like physical collections. So you can't actually see them all or um, apprehend them all in a physical space, even if you wanted to. And then finally, we have the historical financial data. So some challenges about kind of visualizing in a way that makes um, that makes use of these principles and kind of embodies these principles is the availability of the data, the limits of the archive. So the, mention, the example that I mentioned earlier of some materials having been bombed, that is the case with the Hogarth Press archive. So one of their, some of their early records were bombed in the storage facility in the Blitz. So, so we only have certain years that are still remaining. Um, but Knowing that is something that actually is a little bit difficult to come by in the finding aids and things. It's something that you end up learning through histories and other places rather than in the actual data. So this is one of the things that I, I thought about sort of titling this talk metadata for nothing, because I think in some ways that's actually what I'm trying to figure out how to make is like to make the gaps in these materials legible um, and to comment on them in a way. Um, we also need to ba balance quantification with qualification. And we need recovery efforts sometimes that might not lend themselves well to visualization. So sometimes visualization can just over-determine the recovery efforts you're trying to make. And then there's copyright, which I won't go into, but we can talk about in Q&A if you'd like. Um, yes, and finally, yeah, visualizing absences and gaps. Okay, I'm going to end today just by speaking very briefly about something extremely different. Um, so... I didn't entirely realize how much this project was, for me, a way of thinking through digital archives and their um, potentials and limitations. Um, but basically, a couple of years ago, my friend Heather Jessup and I made a fake library and archive. And what we did was we invited our friends who are visual, and some people we didn't know, um, who are visual artists and writers in Canada to collaborate on a project wherein the writer would write a fictional story of a fake artifact. And then the artist, whether a sound artist or a material artist, would make the thing. So, um, and then we created a, a physical exhibit of the items, which we toured at public libraries across um, Canada, starting in Halifax and then all the way to Vancouver and a couple, with a couple of stops in between. And we also made, um, this was really fun for me, we also made a digital archive. Um, and I, I feel like when we made this, we wanted to use some of the tropes of like digital humanities projects to make this piece. So you can see at the bottom, like a little joke there, it's the powered by Power Curator Pro version 3.1. That's not real. <laughs> um, um, and then we, we kind of used a similar setup that a lot of these kinds of exhi digital exhibits would use. Um, uh, as part of this, again, to return to the theme of collaboration, we had some artist talks and really beautiful discussions around the relationships that built up between the artists as they were working together. So this is an image of Karina Wolf and Suzanne Steele, um, who worked together on a piece that I'll show you in a moment. And they sent parcels from Italy to Vancouver that apparently smelled of rose petals, literally. Um, and they had they developed this really beautiful friendship and continued collaboration out of the project. And this is their piece, um, The Beaded Sacred Heart. And um, so we created metadata for these also. Um, we also did a little sneaky thing of like hiding the real artist and uh, writer's names. So it's not displayed in Drupal, but if you download the data set, it's there. Because um, in the exhibit, they, the artists and authors were not named. Um, we had a lot of, and then there, this is the, um, uh, the piece mounted in the Halifax exhibition. Uh, we also did some makerspace fun stuff because uh, um, how is it a digital humanities project if it doesn't have some makerspace elements? Um, so this, these are some of the stamps that our students made for the kids stations at the museum exhibits. And um, these are obviously based on that. This one here is the same uh, piece that you just saw. Oops. And then... Um, yeah, so I'm just going to read a tiny little bit to conclude the section on thinking creatively about these materials um, to sort of from the curator statement that Heather and I wrote to end the exhibition. And 
it ended up being in part a reflection, I think, on what archiving practices do, what we think about when we think about the authority of digital archives, and how we can play a little bit when we encounter these kinds of resources. So this is the curator statement. Perhaps you're wondering now what to make of all this. We created this project in order to investigate the relationship between imaginative work and cultural institutions like libraries, museums, and galleries. We wanted to think about the lies and omissions that these institutions have at times offered us, about the relationship between fakery and fiction, about how even the most seemingly trustworthy historical narratives are stories, and stories by their nature are wily, playful, and much more complicated than they first appear. We've also realized that there are a lot of stories from the past that have not had the chance to be told in museums, galleries, and in the pages of books, perhaps because the artists are not famous or their voices have not been socially valued, perhaps because of systemic injustices or because the work doesn't fit neatly into a classification or category or because the artists are children and are told not to touch things or be very loud. So we invited our friends to play with these questions of fact and fiction, artifact fact and artifice too. With the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, we asked 17 writers and 17 artists, the friends of the library, to think and make art with us. What they gave us back was more wonderful, weirder, and more magical and thought-provoking than we ever could have imagined. In most cases, the creation of the artifacts began with each writer when each writer received a prompt from us. They went, then went about telling the story of a hoax, a fake, or a misdirection. The writers described not only what the objects were, but also, and perhaps most importantly, why the fake might be made, and why their creators would want to lie or mislead. The writers' stories were sent to material artists who created most of what you see in the exhibition. Over two years, we worked with librarians, designers, local historians, students, translators, archivists, young software developers, makerspace magicians, photographers, a brewer, a chemist, and even our own young children. Our families repeatedly did the dishes and rocked the babies so we could play pretend. By the end of the project, our best guess is that over 100 people have collaborated together to make this archive of imaginations come to life. We have not come to any easy answers about Canada's history, the practices of its cultural institutions, or why certain stories are valued more than others. What we have found, though, and what we hope you'll take away from this exhibit, is that working together across disciplines, histories, cultures, and ways of life, with excitement, imagination, and openness to possibility, has the capacity to make unexpected and magical things happen. So often when we feel uncertain or stuck, we listened, and then we said yes as much as possible. Yes to friendship, yes to fiction, yes to fun, yes to that wacky idea about 3D printed vases, yes to an archive of many different imaginations, and yes to make believe. To conclude today, I'd like to show you this talk in uh, the language of Stéphane Sinclair's wonderful contribution, Voyant. And today, in honor of Stéphane Sinclair, I'll add some other yeses to collaborative thinking, to openness, and to experiment. Thank 